Hey, so Melis, uh, it's good to have you here. Yeah? Nice um, long talk, good speech. Thank you. Uh, how do you feel? Exhausted. I feel a little exhausted, <laughs> a little if that's exhausted. possible. But I feel happy. You know, it, it's quite a challenging talk. And, um, it is. It's quite a, a young audience here, which is great. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I think most people were focused most of the time. And uh, so. I've given this talk twice now, and, and I spent some time edit editing it before today. So I'm, I'm happier than I was last time. Good, good. At least and, I enjoy it. So oh, I'm so glad. It's fine. So, well, I'm going to blog it anyway. That's the main thing. I want to, to get it up. And Technology. Up. Yeah. <laughs> How did you end up in ELT in the first place? Uh, well, I, I, it wasn't my dream. Um, I, I don't know. I've heard that before from Jeremy. dream for many native speakers, actually. But I fell into it, really. Uh, a friend, well, the story is that a friend of mine at university told me about the uh, CELTA course at International House. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to apply for this course after university. And I didn't have a big plan uh, for my job. And so I thought, okay, I'll try it. And we both went down for an interview, and I got on the course, and he didn't. Really? Yeah. So he gave me the idea, but he didn't get the, uh, the chance to do the course. Okay. And um, I actually struggled for quite a long time when I started. Uh, it took me quite a long time to enjoy, long time to enjoy teaching. Okay. And uh, it was only little by little that I started to really feel that I could do it well and that it was something I enjoyed. So it was a gradual process. It wasn't something that I immediately felt that I was good at or that I really enjoyed. But you're currently teaching now. I'm not currently teaching. No, um, no. I was recently teaching in London part-time, but at the moment most of my work in ELT is focused on teacher training and talks. And, and teacher training, so like us students? Yeah. I don't teach CELTA courses. I tend to teach ah, okay. one-off things like workshops or one day. Well, my favourite kind of training is a one-week teaching unplugged course. Okay. And we're doing another of those in July in Devon, okay. in the UK, and there are still places, and you, well, you may be too late for Erasmus funding, but uh, it's quite a reasonably priced course anyway. Okay, so um, as, as you were a teacher, um, there have been many methods, many approaches, sure. communicative, lexical. Um, what approach did you apply mostly in your courses? Well, I was trained, I would say, to teach PPP. Okay. Um, in a pretty conventional way, on my CELTA, and I used course books and I planned lessons in a PPP uh, form. But I started to question how useful it was for the learners, and when I heard about the lexical approach, I got very excited because the idea there was to just step away a little bit from grammar, grammar, and try and help people to pick up words, and not just single words, but collocations and chunks of language, as you know. Um, and that felt like a liberation. Um, Task-based learning interested me, but I think le the lexical approach had the biggest impact. Okay. Would you give me uh, that as a tip, that approach as a tip, for me as a, as a teacher in training, to use a lexical approach? I think it's a very good approach to study, and I think it's something you can apply in any lesson. Uh, it isn't, to my mind, strongly activity-based or even task-based. It's about what you, what you do with language. It's about how you encourage learners to look at language. And I think one of the things that excited me at the time was, as somebody explained it, for example, if we were using this text, mm -hmm. um, to a native speaker, the first two sentences, for example, are easy to decode. This is the last breakout session of the day. Okay, so breakout, I anticipate session. So I've already got to session by the time I've heard breakout. Mm -hmm. The last breakout, last of, last of the day, you know, we're predicting because we've heard these collocations mm -hmm. so many times. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to decode it more quickly. And this is one of the main problems that language learners face uh, if they've been taught in quite a non-communicative way and they then find themselves in a communicative context, A, they can't activate the language they've been taught, and B, they struggle to hear what people are saying. Um, uh, I hope your day has been productive. I hope your day has been. I'm, I'm there. You know, productive is, is perhaps a surprise. Um, but 
the idea of attuning learners to look for chunks of language, repeated chunks of language, was a, was a real revelation to me. And it's something that you can do in board work if there's language that's come out of conversation. Mm -hmm. You can identify it in a written text. You can say, look for the, the chunks of words that come together. And you can also allow for repeat practice. So if, for example, you're looking at a text about a crime of some sort, like a, a burglary or maybe a street protest, like the ones I was talking about, you'll find that phrases like street protest, police response, um, government action, recur in a different newspaper account of the same text or the next day's version of events. Mm -hmm. And so you can just start to help learners away from like a stream of words to uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Yes. Uh, if that makes any sense. It makes sense. Uh, but do you think the approach makes the good teacher or is there more to it? What, what makes me a good teacher? Is it the kind of approach I, ha I, 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 I take in my classroom or what is, what is the I, I think, secret? Well, I don't know if there's a secret, but I think what makes a great teacher, in my opinion, is where you are with the students. Um, because I think you can have a very clear understanding of methodology and be extremely well prepared. But if your heart's not in it, um, if you're not actually excited by what you're going to do, then the learners know this immediately. We know this from our time at school. We're pretty experienced as learners. And when a teacher came in the room and didn't want to teach or was bored, we knew that immediately. And it's the same with our learners. True. You can't fool them. Um, and so, Equally, you could have someone who's very excited and very into what they're doing, but completely disorganized and doesn't convey a sense of reassurance uh, to the students. So I don't think there's any one way to teach. I don't think any one approach is perfect in all contexts. And I think the, the one key thing is to, to kind of use all your senses to, to work in the moment. That's well said. You, you should be tired after a class. I mean, I know it's hard to say that when you're teaching five hours a day or eight hours a day or 12 or 15 hours a day in three or four different locations. I know what teachers do. Um, but some, somehow there has to be a balance between doing what's practical for us as teachers mm -hmm. and doing what's going to excite learners. Okay. We, uh, I heard you uh, speak French very uh -huh. fluently. Um, besides French, is there any other language you Not know? Not really. I, haven't, I, don't know. I know a few words of Spanish and a few words of Portuguese and a few words of Arabic and of Polish and a little German. I think if I was, I mean, I studied German at school and if I had to learn German in Germany, I think I could fairly quickly. Okay. But the problem now as a, as a native English speaker is that it's so hard to practice. You know, like speaking French, for example, when yes. I first went to Paris 25, 30 years ago, um, people didn't readily speak English, either because they couldn't or because they didn't want to. But now people want to practice their English. And so when I go into a cafe or a, a, a shop in, in Paris now, thinking, okay, I can practice, and I, I you know, I breathe in, I go, okay, do it, it's my French. <laughs> and I say, oh, je voudrais uh, uh, le petit uh, chose là-bas, they say, oh, you know, do you want uh, you want the pastry or you know, and I'm, yes, I want that one. How much is it? And they're like, yeah, it's ten francs. I'm like, okay. Another it's euro now. Another practice. Oh, okay. It's a euro. <laughs> is it now the twenty first century? It is. Do people have small telephones? Well done. Welcome. So you travel a lot, uh, I think, yeah. conference to conference. Um, what strikes you the most visiting all these different countries, according to teaching? Well, in a way, what I used as, as a, a theme in my talk, that the challenges we face are so similar. You know, it really struck me, as I went to different countries, that the feedback I got on, on sessions was a mix of excitement and it's almost like depression. Excitement because people like the idea of talking with their learners, they like the idea of exploring mm -hmm. spontaneously. And, and then, how can I do it? You know, my school doesn't like me teaching like that, or I used to teach like that, or I have to focus on the test. And it, it's, it's something that I've noticed that is in common across the places I've trained. Okay, um, the, the approach you, prof you well, 
uh, you told us about um, mm. to step away from the authentic way. Um, what happens if me, for example, I am a teacher in training, I want to do something different, and my school says no. How do I? What do I do? Do I con well mm. stick to my plan or? Well, this is a problem that I had when I was teaching 20 years ago because I wanted to teach in this way but I didn't have the vocabulary for it and so when I tried to have that conversation with my DOS and she said, well, I, I kind of like what you're doing but what are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, well, I, I really think it works and it gets the students talking but I couldn't really justify it and I think the one good thing about the dogma movement starting and then the book teaching and plug being published is that you can say, well, you know, this is an approach. Um, maybe it doesn't work all the time. Maybe it needs to be adapted for different contexts. But a key argument to make to teacher managers and, and colleagues, I think, is that very often students are desperate to talk. They're desperate to communicate. And as someone who's taught a lot in London, where I meet students who've studied all over the world, which is another way of answering your previous question, mm -hmm. very often it doesn't matter where they've studied, they're all saying, I spent so much time on grammar in class and I can't speak and I want to speak. Um, and so opening up the class to more interaction, to more spontaneous communication, A, gives students something they want and B, gives them something they need. Because I often think that teaching people the bits of language without really giving them a chance to practice it is like teaching someone to drive a parked car or only letting someone learn to drive in a safe space like a car park, which is where lots of us learn to drive. We find an empty car park and we drive around it and it's safe. But as soon as we pass our test and we get out into traffic, that's where the real learning starts because we realize that half the other drivers are crazy, that there are lots of situations we haven't encountered before and that it's not just what we do, it's what other people do. And that's what happens with language. You might have someone who's passed all the tests mm -hmm. uh, and has managed the small bits of communicative practice in class and then they find themselves speaking English for whatever reason in whatever context and suddenly it's like I don't know how to do this, I've never practiced this. So I, I really think we have a duty as, as educators in this context to give our students a chance to use all their English as much as possible. Which is why I love tasks where there's no language aim, where the aim is communicative and that relates to task-based learning. Is this your advice as well? Uh, for us as teachers in training to stick to more communicative skills and I, I think it's about blending both. Blending. Um, there's a very interesting blog that was written some years ago by a teacher called Dale Coulter and he just finished his CELTA course and on the last day of the CELTA course the trainer said oh you might want to look at this book Teaching Unplugged. And, you know the course had finished and the trainer said I think it's interesting maybe you'd be interested and so what this guy did was to experiment with it when he got his first teaching job but he experimented with it in a really uh, sort of principled way mm -hmm. he had two classes one class he taught with a course book the other class he taught without and he made notes of what he was doing along the way so in a sense he was getting the this the kind of um, on the ground training that we all need from using established practices when we start teaching using the course book and learning from that but he was also trying things out differently. And one of the arguments that Scott makes at the moment, Scott Thornbury, is that dogma, I think dogma is great for learners. That's how I got into it from teaching, because I thought it was better for the learners. But Scott argues, and I agree with him, that it's better for teachers. It's important for teachers to, to challenge themselves and to find out how they can work in the moment. Okay, but I suppose in, in a slightly shorter answer to your question mm -hmm. would be, don't feel you have to do it all at once. It's not either or. It's not all or nothing. Right. Um, it's just trying to find moments in class. And it might be saying, right, at the end of every class, I'm going to take five minutes, and we're just going to chat. And I'll find one language point to look at. And if I'm not sure about studying it in class that day, I'll look it up. I'll do some homework myself as a teacher, and I'll bring it back to class the next morning. And I'll say, remember we were chatting? Remember this? phrase kept coming up or this grammar point, let's have a look at it now. Yes. And then you start to get a little bit of roll on between classes, based not on what's in the book, just, but on what they were trying to say.
I agree that that's mm -hmm. some useful advice. Oh, oh, so. Yes, cool. I think Dogma says us that it's time for another break. For okay. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks.